What's it like to be a play away from the national championship game? And what's it like to be Marvin Harrison Jr. going into 2023? These are questions I asked and you will hear answered when Ohio State's Ryan Day and Marvin Harrison Jr. join the show on our first day at Big Ten Media Days. Let's go. It's the number one college football show. I'm pleased to be joined by Ohio State head coach Ryan Day. Coach, how you doing? Doing great, man. How are you? I'm good, sir. I want to talk about your offense. I want to talk about some moving pieces there, but I want to start with the quarterback derby that you're in the midst of. You bet had a pretty good track record when it comes to identifying quarterbacks and projecting the one that should be starting for you. What are you looking for from Kyle McCord and Devin Brown as you go into preseason camp? We want to get them in as many game situations as possible. Uh, they both had really good summers, uh, but at the end of the day, it's going to come down to who moves a team down the field and wins games. Um, you know, and part of that is, you know, your experience coaching quarterbacks over the years is trying to identify the things you see that are going to be important. But I guess the good news is that most of these guys are only going to have to make their routine plays routinely at quarterback. You know, we have some good depth at quarterback, and that whole room is going to have to play well. But we have some really good pieces around them, as you know, you know, really talented at the skill level. You know, we're going to have to fill in a couple holes in the offensive line. Uh, but, you know, we got a good defense. Uh, we have some good pieces around them. So we don't need them to do anything extraordinary early, early on. And then as the season goes on, they can grow with their game. You mentioned your skill players, and you have some of the best in the country at their given positions, guys like Travion Henderson, Mayan Williams, and, of course, Marvin Harrison and Emeka Egbuka, among others. But I want to just get started with this, Coach. Have you ever had a wide receiver like Marvin Harrison Jr.? No, no, um, just tremendous when it comes to, first off, his talent, you know, size, um, you know, the way he's built, speed, uh, very, very unique. But then when you combine that with his discipline and his skill, he, he makes, you know, it just, it's just very different than some of the other guys who've been around, all really good receivers, but, but Marvin's different and unique. I read a story that you had seen him on the jugs machine, which is not unusual to see a wide receiver get and work on the jugs machine, but that he was going through the script for the upcoming game on the jugs machine. What does that say about his work ethic? Yeah, I think that's the part that makes him different is that he has all this talent, but he's acquired such great discipline and skill. And a part of that is the discipline of taking care of his body, uh, but also the work he does in the Woody. It's pretty legendary and documented at this point. I mean, the amount of time he spends on the jugs machine. And, and like you said, I've seen it after games. I'll be like after the game's over, back in the Woody, and he's, he's back on the jugs going through something that you know, he saw in the game. Um, you know, this is just his focus. He's obsessed with being great. And you know, that's uh, a tribute to his work ethic and his discipline and the skill that he's created that's matched up with his talent. Guy across the sideline from him most times last year is Emeka Abuka. And before we knew that Marvin was this talent, that was a guy that we were all really looking at to be one of the next best wide receivers in your room, but also one of the better all-purpose players in all of the country. How are you planning to use him in 2023? Well, like we did last year, uh, you know, one of the most productive wide receivers, like you said, in the country. Uh, this is somebody who can hurt you in a lot of different ways. He's big, he's strong, he's physical, he's tough mentally, he's tough physically, he's got great hands, runs great routes. Uh, I mean, Emeka is as good as I've been around. Um, understands, you know, leverage, uh, makes clutch plays. You know, we needed a play in that Penn State game down the stretch. I mean, he ran right by the corner and made a huge play in that game. Um, you know, he does so many things for us. Uh, I just think, you know, he's as good a receiver as there is in the country. It's no secret that I'm a huge fan of your coaching staff, and it is no secret that I'm a huge fan of your passing game coordinator in Brian Hartline. I know the reputation he has for recruiting, but what have you seen about him that helps develop him as a coach and possibly the kind of guy that you might let call plays for you? Yeah, I think it started off when, you know, he was 
put into a situation at 18 where he had an opportunity to take over that room, and he took it, took, took it off and, and ran with it. You know, it was great in that, at that time, Terry McLaurin, Paris Campbell, th those guys were all seniors, you know, K.J. Hill. These guys were older guys who had been around, and it, it just worked. Um, you know, Brian played at Ohio State, played in the NFL, so had credibility in terms of, you know, what he knew and his knowledge. But a big part of that is your connection, ability to have guys listen to you and put it on the field, and he did that. And so I think that combined with the, the level of quarterback play has just built – um, you know, an unbelievable room there in the passing game. And so it's an exciting time to be a quarterback and a wide receiver. And a big part of that is because of Brian. One of the things that I do not envy about your job is that everybody looks at one game on the schedule and they decide whether or not you're good or bad based on that one game. It's really difficult for me to wrap my head around being a missed field goal away from, I think, winning the national championship to feeling like you let people down. What are you doing to try to lessen that burden on yourself? Or do you, do you invite it? Do you say, no, this is the job. This is what we do at Ohio State. Uh, a little bit of all those things, RJ. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, you know, you have to look at it from a lot of different angles. And certainly we look at it every day and think about it every day. I know I do, and, and so does our team. Um, but, you know, you can look at it a lot of different ways. And, and you know, being a play away from having a completely com different conversation right now uh, is not only frustrating, but it's also encouraging because our guys this season, you know, we know how close we are. Now we have to re replace a couple pieces, but we have more experience coming back on defense than we have since 19. And, you know, we have a lot of good pieces coming back. So uh, the, the focus this off season has been about competing every day. You know, the ability to say, hey, I'm going to compete against you and I'm going to win. And if you're doing that over time and everything you do, that's going to carry over to the preseason. You know, we're counting on that to make a difference, you know, in the fall. Holy smokes, you talk about 19, that defense and Chase Young and those guys are still seared into my brain. I get lots of guff because I made Chase Young my Heisman pick based on, you know, 21 half tackles for loss, 16 and a half sacks. I don't care about what a quarterback's doing if that's what you're doing on the defensive line. And then you got a guy like JT Tuimolau who showed up last year in a big way for you, like unlike anybody has in the 21st century at Penn State. The question I have is, do you think the defense is ready to take that leap to get back to what they were doing in 2019 and 2023? Yeah, that's the expectation. That's, that's what we think can happen in year two of Jim Knowles' defense. But uh, I guess when you, when you look at it and take a step back, uh, the biggest thing that we've, we've got to eliminate are the big plays. You know, there's just too many explosive plays in those last two games. But you can't deny there was a lot of progress made. And uh, this is the most experience we've had over there in a while. Um, I think it's important for JT and Jack Sawyer, uh, Ty Hamilton, Ty Lake Williams, Mike Hall, to really be the guys that they, we can count on, you know, 50, 60, 70 plays a game, um, you know, and carry the water. Also, you got Tommy Eichenberg and Steel Chambers coming back. <clears throat> We've added some really, co really good um, guys on the perimeter. Um, you know, Lorenzo Styles transferred in. Davison and Biggison um, transferred in. We have uh, Calvin Simpson Hunt, Jermaine Matthews, some different guys. So, and I think Denzel Burke and Jordan Hancock have had tremendous off seasons. So, uh, way more depth at corner than we've ever had. Last year, we were a little thin at times. Um, the safety position will be critical. Sonny Styles is somebody that um, I think is, is, you know, people will really be talking about this season because of his versatility. He's really athletic and it can really have an impact. He, he should be a freshman, but he played last year almost as a senior in high school. And so you combine all those things together with the experience and the talent, um, there's great optimism. We've seen more change in the sport in the last five years than we have, I think, in the last 30. And the question I have, Coach, is what do you think about this change? And does it still fire you up to want to go coach football every single day? Yeah, because it ultimately comes down to, you know, having an impact on young people. That's why you get into coaching. <clears throat> you know, winning championships. You have to win championships. You have to win the rivalry game. You have to do all those things. Because if they don't, they're going to find a new coach. That's just the way it goes. That's the way life happens. But ultimately, those are the answers to trivia questions. You know, well, what really matters is the impact you have on young people. And we have to continue to stay focused on having an impact on young people. And although things are changing on a, you know, rapid level, uh, that has to stay the focus, is that we're, we're, 
uh, putting these guys in a position to reach their dreams and goals. And along the way, you know, we have to win championships. That's part of what it means to be a Buckeye. But we can't lose focus on why we got into coaching. And that's, again, to have an impact on these guys. Last year, you had a problem keeping Travion Henderson and Mayan Williams healthy for one reason or another. I'm curious, has Coach Marotti changed up how he conditions them going into preseason, trying to keep them much more uh, injury – well, going through injury prevention would be the way that I look at that. But what are he doing to try to help them overcome that obstacle of being injured? Yeah, probably one of the most exciting things is having having a healthy Travion going into the first game this year for us. Just and then and then Mayan as well, because like you said, that that was that was hard on Travion. It's hard on everybody. Um, same thing with Mayan. We look at everything we do. We look at every single workout we do. We look at every single practice and how we do it. And we try to identify whether there's anything we can do differently to make sure that we're preparing these guys better. Uh, there really has been no adjustments on that. You know, a couple things here and there with, a, with an insole or something like this uh, to try to do some, some prevention in different areas. But, but ultimately, Mick uh, is the best in the business at using sports science uh, to kind of lead the way, but also, you know, combining that with an old school work ethic. I think that's what make, makes Mick the best strength and conditioning coordinator in the country. Last question for you, Coach, pertains to the future of the Big Ten. You're going to invite USC and UCLA to this conference and make it a little bit larger next year. But I'm curious about your relationship with Coach Kelly. It feels like one that's been enduring for the better part of 25 years at this point. How excited are you to get to face Chip Kelly in a conference environment in the future? I'm excited for Ohio State uh, to play UCLA. I am not excited about playing Chip Kelly. Um, first off, he's a great coach. Secondly, People don't realize what that's like until you actually have to play um, not only your friend, but your mentor. And uh, so I'm not looking forward to that, no matter what anybody says. I, just, I still think it's exciting that UCLA and USC are in the Big Ten, and I think some of these games are going to be tremendous for the schools. Uh, but that day, that day will be a challenge personally. Ohio State head coach Ryan Day, thank you so much for taking time to join us here on the number one college football show. Always great to see you, man. Thanks. I'm pleased to be joined by Ohio State wide receiver Marvin Harrison Jr. Marvin, how you doing? Good. Thanks for having me. I appreciate you being here. Uh, you've had a remarkable first couple of years at Ohio State, uh, finishing the college football playoff just a field goal short against Georgia. And I ask it sincerely, do you have a mm. hard time staying in the present? Uh, no, not really. Uh, I just like to take things uh, one day at a time and just win the day. If I can stick to my routine, stick to my schedule for that day, um, I'll worry about all the things in the future uh, when it comes. I've read that your schedule, your routine is very important to you. And it seems like you have yeah. been treating football like a job for a very long time. How long have you been treating football like a job? Uh, probably since high school. Uh, I just know uh, what it takes to you know, reach a certain level of success. Um, you know, all the things that go into it, you know, the, the extra work, taking care of your body, eating right, and things like that. Uh, I just try to do that to the best that I can. Have you always been so understated in your effort? Um, yeah, yeah. I think it's just something that uh, God instilled into me and that I also learned from my parents as well. Uh, it's just always uh, do as much as you can and um, everything will work out. One of the stories that I read in preparation for this interview is about how you prepare during a game week. And it's one thing to know yeah. that a receiver is working on the jugs machine. It's another thing to know that a receiver is running through the script the week of the game <laughs> on the jugs machine. Yeah. Where did you learn to do that and why is that important to you? Uh, I think just preparation, just prepare for the game. And I like to put myself you know, in the game so when the game comes, there's nothing I haven't done before. So um, I know if, if a certain play that I have, you know, a slant here, uh, I kind of figure that might be called on third down. Let me work it from the right hash. Let me work it from the left hash, middle of the field, um, just different angles to put myself in the game so when the game comes, I've already done it before. And sometimes when the game comes, you are making 
the miraculous look ordinary. I'm sure you are familiar with the nickname Marvin the Martian because sometimes you're making plays <laughs> that the, yeah. the rest of us cannot make. I understand that preparation yeah. is a big part of that, but so is ability. When did you first mm-hmm. know that you had the ability to be an outstanding wide receiver? Probably not until last year, um, going through the year, uh, kind of seeing the plays that I was making. Um, still, some of them aren't surprising to me. Once I feel like I just, I'm just out there playing football. But I think, you know, the Indiana catch when I got my one foot in, um, I don't usually shock myself, but that shocked me a little bit. Did you think you got the one foot in? Oh, yeah, I, I knew I got the one foot in for sure. I asked that because I read that Coach Ryan Morrison, passing game coordinator at St. Joe's Prep, said that he had changed the drill because you asked for him to change the drill from one foot inbound, <laughs> high school, college, to two feet inbounds. Yeah. Have you right. always wanted to challenge yourself uh, at the level of an NFL wide receiver? Yes. Um, I think that's the standard that I kind of have in my head. If I go out to practice, I need to be an NFL wide receiver already. Uh, even you know, high school, that's how my mindset was. Um, you know, kind of like, like I say, you stay in the present, like, okay, college, but you're always preparing for that next level, and you know, the biggest level you can get to is the NFL. So, um, like I said, practicing two feet, that's just one of the little things that I can do. Caught passes from C.J. Stroud the last couple of years. This year, a player that you had played a lot of high school football with in Kyle McCord is competing for that job. Do you find it right. much easier to get along with a quarterback like McCord simply because you played high school football together? Oh uh, Yeah, I think you got three years under your belt uh, with one specific quarterback. You kind of already have that connection development. I know where he's going to put the ball in certain routes. and uh, But more importantly, I think Kyle, we just have a great friendship off the field uh, that can continue to grow. What's his work ethic like? It's just as hard as mine, really. Um, you know, usually his arm might get a little tired, or my legs might be a little dead, so he might not throw routes here and there, but we communicate constantly on uh, when we want to throw passes. Um, he watches film all the time. Uh, if I'm in the, you know, the field catching on a seeker, um, he's in a, uh, the quarterback room watching film, just learning that any ways he can get better. So his workout, uh, work ethic is just as tireless as mine. It's been a theme on the show that I do for Fox Sports called the number one college football show that players that have played together in college play well together at the NFL level. And I think that goes back to high school. Jamar Chase and Joe Burrow come to mind. Tua Tagovailoa, Jalen Waddell, Devontae Smith, mm-hmm. Jalen Hurts. I wonder if you could unpack for me why you think that that it is true, if it is true at all. Yeah, I think one thing you kind of mentioned, they're all quarterback wide receivers. And that connection is just so important. Um, to be on the same page as your quarterback, and that takes you know, tons and tons and tons of reps um, throughout the week preparing for that you know, that game. But like you said, me and Kyle already have you know, three years under our belt um, playing together, so um, we already kind of have the connection. We're just enhancing it at this point. You mentioned not long ago that you didn't know that you were going to be or could be a great wide receiver until last year. I wonder how much of that has to yeah. do with, one, you being hard on yourself. But also, that room yeah. that you're a part of is so talented. Did you ever feel like you were falling behind, or was it simply that you weren't meeting your own expectations? Um, I think like you said, I'm very hard on myself, so that's probably number one. But then when you're in that you know, wide receiver room, you're kind of uncom- you're common amongst the uncommon. So uh, we have Garrett Wilson, you have Chris Olave, you have Jackson Smith and Jigba, like all these great receivers, first round draft picks, like. Um, that standard is very high. Uh, so whereas you, know, you might be doing good for you know, um, the standard of another school at Ohio State might not be good enough. So um, I think definitely make sure of both. All of you have played for Coach Hartline in that receiver room. I wonder if you could tell us something that perhaps people don't know about what makes Coach Hartline such a great receivers coach. Um, I think he gives a lot of props for his recruiting. But just the kind of person he is, you know, off the field, um, like you say, I think the biggest thing, he can relate to us. Uh, he's been a college student, a college student athlete before. He's been a wide receiver um, in the NFL, all, what we're all striving to get to. So uh, he just relates to us really well, and that kind of makes things you know, really easy to in the receiver room, just talking to him about anything. My last one for you, Marvin. What do you want for your season 
in 2023? Um, BTT on North, win the Big Ten Championship. Those are my two goals this year. I've yet to do either one of those things, so um, those are my two goals. Well, good luck to you in achieving both of those goals this season. Marvin Harrison Jr., Ohio State thank wide receiver, much. thank you so much for joining us here on the number one college football show. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. I'm pleased to be joined by oh, Ohio you. State defensive end JT Tui Maloal. You had the best game mm. that, frankly, anybody has seen on the defensive side of the ball in quite some time. The first player in the 21st century with Six tackles, two picked off, including a pick six, made two sacks, forced fumble, and a fumble recovery against a very good Penn State team. Did it surprise you at all that grown men like myself were going berserk when they saw that stat line? Uh, yes and no. Uh, you know, I'm always a dude that's, you know, remains humble. But, you know, just to, just to hear how everybody was reacting. And when I went home, I finally just kind of went on TV and watched it for myself. And I kind of had the same reaction, but to see everybody react like that, I think it's a, it's a true, um, you know, it's a, you can see God's work and just a trusting his plan and, uh, you know, trusting his talents that he gifted me with and just use them to the best of my ability. I'm curious what you expected from your time at Ohio State because your recruitment was such a loud event, right? Taking it all the way up to the 4th of July mm -hmm. and then finally deciding to <clears throat> sign a financial aid agreement at Ohio State. Did you feel like it was a little overhyped or you're right on time? I think it was a uh, right on time. You know, God's time is always the best time. And, but I think my time at Ohio State has just always uh, pushed myself to be the best version, to be the best player. And, uh, you know, going in, everybody said I was a great player, but I feel like I could I could be an even better a better player and uh, increase my talents by coming here. And I think I just had to, you know, stay patient, stay close to God, and uh, continue to grind and not let anything get to my head. Coach Johnson has his own legend around him for the kind of players that he mm -hmm. has developed over the years, you being one of them. Could you tell us what makes Coach Johnson so special? Man, for the people that are not there, um, that's a dude filled with a lot of wisdom, a lot of knowledge, and a lot of, uh, he knows a lot of things. Uh, he's been around a lot of players. So one thing about Coach Jay is he's, uh, you know, he won't yell at you, but he will uh, talk to you and like just say he's disappointed, but that's how the way he communicates with us. You know, he communicates with us as a, it's like a, I look at it as like a grandpa and a grandson type of relationship, as well as a coach and player relationship, but he just has that way to connect with you and just to, and just to talk with you and help you understand things better than just uh, and just telling you once and just have you go out there. It's like once he says something, you understand, you know where he's coming from, and you can apply it to your game and even apply it to life. You know, he's not just a coach, but he's a great person too. Is it as simple as you just don't want to let him down? Uh, I think that plays a role, but I think Coach Jay does a job of uh, does a good job, sorry, of just letting us know that you know he wants us to be the best version of ourselves, and he doesn't expect anything. You know, he doesn't want us to please him, but more as just please yourself. You know, he's going to coach you. He's going to get it wherever our dreams were coming into Ohio State. He always remembers it, and that was one thing that I always uh, that stood out to me is uh, the dreams and the goals I told him I wanted to achieve before coming to Ohio State. He still remembers them to this day, and he still uh, reminds me. So, you know, the expectation of uh, not letting him down is also a factor, but it's not, it's not as big as just, uh, just having fun and, and, and uh, being able to learn from him. Did you learn something new about yourself in the loss to Georgia in the college football playoff? Yes, learned a lot of things, you know, uh, even though it was a loss, uh, a lot of loss, uh, loss, sorry, loss and uh, losses in general, they always teach you lessons. Sorry, I don't know if I worded it right, but they always teach you lessons. And, and for me, it was a, a big testimony and, uh, to just looking who we went up against and Georgia being a great team and knowing how we did and, and uh, knowing the competition we went up against. It was just, hey, this, this proves to us that we have it. We just have to be consistent, stay with each other, and just and just battle and continue to play at that level of uh, competitiveness every game, every every quarter. What do you think the challenge is for the defense in 2023? 
think the biggest challenge is uh, staying together, uh, not letting not letting anybody just dictate us, but us to be able to motivate each other, staying strong and staying within the brotherhood. Uh, that's what I've been talking about all day and just always preaching is that our brotherhood is so strong and so tight that, you know, anybody outside can't break it. And I think that would be the toughest challenge to face, you know, going out there and, and playing, but playing our ball and just not letting anybody dictate, dictate how we play. Ohio State defensive end JT Tui Maloal, thank you so much for joining us here on the number one college football show. Thank you for having me. I'm pleased to be joined by Wisconsin head coach Luke Fickle. Coach, how you doing? I'm doing well. We're kind of wrapping up a little bit here, so uh, you're getting the tail end of this. Well, hey, maybe I get you, you a little looser, a little easier going. We'll see. We'll find <laughs> out. But, Coach, I want to start with this. 21 straight winning seasons at Wisconsin. They are in it every single year, but it's been about 10 years since they won a Big Ten championship and never made the college football playoff. What do you think it's going to take to get over that hump, to get back to that Big Ten championship and eventually play in the CFP? Well, I mean, like it does every year, right? you got to be able to play your best ball at the end of the season. And I think for us in the development of what we're doing, you know, it's not trying to get there in week one, right? <clears throat> there is a process to what we do. And sometimes when you haven't been there in a while, all the focus becomes on the destination and, and it's not, you know, put into the process and what it takes to, to do that. And you got to start somewhere. And um, I believe we've got the right nucleus. I believe we've got the big guys up front in particular. We've got a, we've got a running back. I, I just think we've got some things that walking in the door give us an opportunity to have some success. Now we've got to grow upon that and build upon that. I'm curious, Coach, you decided to coach Wisconsin in the bowl game against Oklahoma State. You guys got to win. Why was it important for you to be on the field and help that team and really be able to evaluate what was already there? Well, that, that, you just said it. That's what it was. It was about evaluating. And it wasn't just the players that you were evaluating. It wasn't just the game that I wanted to evaluate. It was the history. It was you know, the culture, the things, the way guys prepared, the way guys practiced, the way guys played. Um, there were so many more things that I thought were critical when taking over a program with such history and taking over a program that really is, it was in a pretty good place. I know it wasn't exactly where they wanted it to be, and that's why some changes were made. But by nature, the culture of the things that they've done there and had done there, um, I thought were really, really strong. And I thought it was important for me to be able to evaluate that, watch that, see that, um, so that I didn't make the biggest mistakes in, in changing things that I thought were really, really strong and solid there. One of the strengths of the program and one of the legacies of the program is the run game. They've always been good about that at Wisconsin. 6-0 and last year when they rushed for 192 yards and 22-1 and over the last four years when they rushed 192 yards. But the thing that stuck out to me is 113th in a modern innovation called the forward pass. And you brought in Phil Longo, who is known to air it out from time to time. What made you think that that was the guy to help you out? Well, it wasn't about, it wasn't about air raid. It wasn't about, you know, the things that Phil has even done. It was about people. And I think more than anything, the uniqueness of, of his philosophies that, that might look and sound a little bit different based on throwing the football, but the philosophies of, you know, what I believe in and, and where the game is won and how things, you know, need to be built, um, we're falling straight in line. And, uh, so that relationship that we've had was, was quite unique. And it wasn't a matter of, Hey, you know, can you do this or can we change or can we do this? It was kind of the same kind of thing that, that Chris McIntosh, when he hired me, he didn't ask me what kind of offense or what are you going to change or what are you going to do? He believed and trusted in me and kind of the same thing with Phil. We'd had a relationship. I trust and believe in him. I understand that intelligent people find a way to be successful and do what they need to do to find ways to win. And he will do that and we will do that together. You already impressed the hell out of me into the portal. You went and got Nick Evers, who feels like a really good prospect you can develop. But you also got a guy that I think the world of and Tanner Mordecai. But the thing that stuck out to me was what you had to say about him going, he's exactly what I was hoping for. He kept his mouth shut and went to work. Why was that attitude so important to you to have in your quarterback? I think that's what we had evaluated about what was here. It wasn't something that him or I needed to come in and think, we just got to put our stamp on this, right? We needed to 
both kind of recognize the great things that are out there. And ultimately, when you can earn the respect of the people behind you or around you um, from the way that you do things as opposed to the things that you say, I think it lasts. I think it gives you an opportunity to keep those guys and to maintain that leadership, especially through adverse situations. And, you know, I was hoping and believing that maybe he would be like that, but you never quite know as you get guys and how vocal are they, how much do they have the awareness of what it is that needs to be done. And um, he's completely exceeded my expectations with those types of things, that's for sure. I don't mind saying it, Coach. You have surprised the hell out of me with how you have not just embraced Wisconsin's culture, but really tried to give it back to some of the fans. The launch being a big success, you are wearing the school colors with a level of pride that I think borders on that of a fan. Well, How did you <laughs> talk yourself into, no, I'm going to bet you be much more open. I'm going to try to tell people what the program is about, and we're going to try to meet the standard they set for us. No, I, I guess recognizing what they have done and some of the experiences that I've had, um, you know, I think it's, it's helped me, right? I mean, we understand how passion, that's a beautiful thing about the Big Ten in particular, right? The passion that they all, we all have for, you know, our universities, our colors, our, our logos and things like that. And, and I think it's important for us to recognize that. I think when people ask, oh, do you have, uh, you got an incredible knowledge of the Big Ten and how does that help you? And I don't know that it helps me understanding you know, what they've done at, at football wise at Iowa or what they've done at Michigan because you've studied them, but understanding what the deep rootedness of Big Ten football looks like and, and how you need to go about embracing so many of the traditions, no matter what school it is. Uh, I think that for me is what has given me an opportunity to kind of step in here. And I know we haven't played a game or won a game, but to recognize and to understand the, the ability to embrace all things that make not just Wisconsin, but Big Ten football special. I've spent a lot of our time today talking about the offense, but I'd be remiss, you being a defensive head coach, what is the 3-3 stack doing for your defense, and why is Mike Trussell the guy to run it? Well, there was no doubt. I mean, the beautiful thing about Mike is he, he came here not exactly knowing what his role was going to be, right? We still had some things that were in the, in the, in the works for, for a good month and had to figure out how that was all going to be worked out here. And um, I think the beautiful thing about that is, too, is, is even defensively, we've got to find ways to add to and develop what, what it is that we've got, right? I mean, they've been pretty darn good defensively here for the last, I don't know, 15 years, 10 years in particular. Um, so we'd be crazy not to think that what they've done isn't really good and how do we imp implement that into a lot of the things that we do because ultimately it comes down to the people that you have, right? I mean, you can recruit and you can kind of move yourself in, in different ways, but ultimately when you've got the guys here, uh, you've got to put them in positions to do what it is that they can do. So even defensively, I think there's some, there's some changing and there's some things that we're evolving to do, but there's also some things that we're really grasping onto and holding onto that they've been that they've done really, really well here. Wisconsin head coach Luke Fickle, thank you so much for joining us here on the number one college football show. I'm pleased to be joined by Wisconsin running back Braylon Allen. Braylon, how you doing? I'm great. How are you? I'm good. Uh, quickly, I say quickly, how does a 17-year-old safety prospect become a bell cow back at Wisconsin? <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a wild kind of transition for me. Um, not really playing running back that much in high school, just kind of like seven games at, um, you know, my last season. But, uh, you know, right before I got on campus, I got that call, and uh, it was exciting for me. I mean, I was a 10-year-old kid watching Melvin Gordon, you know, run for four-way out in Nebraska. And, you know, ever since then, that was uh, something that I wanted to do, you know, kind of be in that, that same position. So. Um, it, was, it was crazy how it worked out for me, but um, here we are, and it's, it's been the best decision that was ever it really made for me, but uh, I would say the best decision I ever made. After having watched Melvin Gordon rush for those 400 against Nebraska, knowing who Jonathan Taylor is to the program, knowing who Ron Dane is to the program, James White is to the program, I can keep going, Monty Ball. How does it feel to be mentioned in the same sentence as all those cats? It's a it's a crazy it's a crazy feeling. It's uh 
like I said, you know, watching Melvin, um, watching Monty, James, those guys, and, and then JT when I was in, you know, getting uh, a little older, you know, more so in high school, but uh, it's just, uh, it's a blessing, honestly, just to be part of that, that brotherhood um, and kind of have those guys in my corner as, as resources for me, whatever I need, whether it's about football, anything else, you know, they're all uh, available for me to reach out to and I'm always open to give advice. So um, it's, it's, been a, it's been an amazing experience. When you are as talented as you are and you are as big and thick as you are, it does boggle our minds that you were at one point 17 years old doing all of this, but it feels as if you kind of got tired of hearing us say that. Did you feel like, hey, get past the 17 stuff, I'm out here playing really great football at Wisconsin. Can we just stick to that? <laughs> no, I didn't really get sick of it. I, I think it just made it kind of a cooler story. Um, you know, I obviously had a, a pretty good season um, that year, so it was cool just to, you know, obviously you see the, you know, the stats or whatever, the, 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 the tape, um, but then you just add the fact that I was 17 year old, years old on top of it. Uh, is that it was pretty cool to me, but, you know, obviously last year's, I wasn't 17, so I wasn't getting, uh, it, you know, it wasn't the same, but uh, it was it was cool when it, while it lasted. I run into Badgers fans everywhere. There's even one that owns the gym where I work out in Tulsa, Oklahoma, right? Huge Badger fan. But it does kind of get underneath their skin that the offense is going to change its identity from something that, frankly, has worked for 21 straight years, 21 straight winning seasons, but I'm looking at it from your standpoint, and I got to ask it this way. How excited are you to see a six-man box? I'm in incredibly excited. It's, uh, you know, something that uh, I'm not gonna, I wasn't used to. So, you know, even the spring ball, the early, you know, parts of learning this offense, you could definitely just tell a difference in the, the amount of space um, that was there running the football. Um, and it also gives me a great opportunity to, you know, showcase my talents as a receiver and a pass protector on film as well, which is obviously um, a major part in, in the game at the next level. So I definitely want to show my, uh, my ability to, to do both those things as well as kind of refine my skills as a runner. Um, and you know, this, this, this new staff has done a great job, helped me identify weaknesses, um, strengths, and kind of attack those and you know, implement more things into my game uh, that, that are going to make me a, a better all-around back. I'm an air raid truther, which is another way of saying that I've known about Coach Longo for some years and his wristbands. But I'm curious how often you have to remind people, yo, he had really great tailbacks at North Carolina and Michael Carter, Javante Williams. I'm going to get the ball. I'm going to get opportunities to run on people. Have you even seen that play out during spring ball? Yeah, definitely have. I mean, it's not, you know, we're not just going away from, from the run game. It's a... Uh, it's just more balanced now, I would say, and you know, just a more spread out formation, which gives us even more lanes to run through. Uh, as you know, there's like we said before, not as many guys in the box, and the defense is just more spread out as a whole. So, um, even if I don't get the ball as much, I feel like I'll be just as effective, if not more effective, than years past, just because you know it's it's going to be more wide and more open for me to uh, be able to have more uh, yards per carry and um, kind of you know not have to run into such a to a stacked, stacked box. How has Coach Fickle integrated into the culture of Wisconsin football? He's a very in intense coach. Uh, he's uh, the same guy every day. You know, shows up and has that fire and energy that kind of is contagious to us. You know, it's a, it's a crazy feeling just sitting in the meeting room and, you know, he's talking about whatever whatever it might be before practice, might just be a regular team meeting, but he has your heart pounding like you're about to go to play a game. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's, it's crazy, you know, he's, he's like that every single day. So uh, he's just a very, very contagious energy and a great coach, you know, great leader. Um, and, you know, he knows how to win football games. You've been spending a lot more time with Coach Longo for obvious reasons, being the offensive coordinator. I'm curious, has the offense been difficult to pick up or even simpler than some you've had in the past? Uh, I wouldn't say it's been very difficult. Um, it's just a, a little different now that we're not huddling or anything. You know, you kind of got to – the biggest adjustment is looking to the sideline, trying to get your signal rather than hearing it in the huddle. 
uh, that's been the biggest thing, but in terms of scheme, uh, it hasn't been too difficult. What is that been like, trying to remember that you have to check with me and then you get to play and hope that everybody's on the same page? Yeah, that's, that's really what it is. I mean, the key is communicating between us on the field uh, as an offense, uh, making sure everybody is on the same page, but uh, definitely a change of pace. And it's, it's very fast, too, so you know, it's really hard to run, have a long run, get back up and try to find the signal. So you, I kind of sometimes got to rely on uh, Tanner to let me know what the play is. Um, so that's, that's the, the main key of his communication between the players. I'm glad you brought up Tanner Mordecai, quarterback at Wisconsin, transferred in from Southern Methodist, but also a Texas guy, right? So, yeah, he's probably brought in to try to help you better understand and operate the offense, but I'm curious, what have you had to teach him about being in Madison, Wisconsin as a dude from Waco, Texas? Yeah, he's, uh, I mean, he kind of learned on his own getting there in January, um, what that's like. So, you know, not being really used to a winter, especially a Wisconsin winter. This one was extra brutal, extra long. So he, uh, he got to witness that firsthand. So he kind of learned that on, on his own, but uh, not much really. I mean, he's a, uh, you know, he's a, a guy that just shows up to work every day and uh, does what he needs to do. And, you know, he's, um, he's been around for, he's been in the game for a while now. So he understands what it's like. And, you know, he's, he's been, had the ups and downs of college football, um, which is very important, you know, because, you know, once adversity inevitably hits, you know, he's going to know how to, to face that, which uh, is, is what we need, especially at that position. So um, have had it really teach him much, man. He's kind of just kind of, you know, grabbed it on his own and, you know, been a, a great leader for us. Well, I am excited to see how you and Tanner lead Wisconsin into this new era of Wisconsin Badger football. Wisconsin running back Braylon Allen, thank you so much for joining us here on the number one college football show. Yes, sir, I appreciate you having me. I'm pleased to be joined by Wisconsin quarterback Tanner Mordecai. Tanner, how you doing? I'm good, man. I'm good. Thank you for having me on. I'm excited to speak with you because the last time I got to speak with you was actually when you were at Waco Midway and you're getting ready to go to Oklahoma and go on this journey that is taking you from Oklahoma to Southern Methodist, to passing for 7,000 yards, and over 70 touchdowns. But now that you're in Wisconsin, what are you excited about playing in the Big Ten? Um, I, I think I'm excited to get back to a, a big stage, um, play for, um, you know, just a, a big great university, an awesome place like Madison that just has a rich culture of, of winning and uh, just a, a great football environment. And um, I'm just really excited to play in Camp Randall. Has it sunk into you that you represent a changing of the guard offensively in that it feels like you're in a position to rewrite some record books because of the nature of the offense that Coach Longo is running? How does that sit with you? I'm excited. I'm very excited. I mean, I think, I think Coach Longo is one of the top offensive minds in, in all of football. Um, he's been very successful. So I think this, this offense as a group is uh, really excited to play for him and, and uh, show the conference and the nation uh, what we're about. Coach Fickle has lauded your attitude in coming into the program. So I'm going to ask you to tell me what was your attitude coming into the program? Uh, I mean, going back to January, um, you know, I, I obviously didn't know uh, a lot of guys. Um, so to, to come into a leadership role, I, I think relationships was very important to me. Um, so, you know, to, to earn trust and respect in these relationships, uh, I think that that's kind of built over time. And, you know, I think the trust and the, the respect comes from uh, what Coach Fickle's talking about. Uh, I came in, head down, and... Uh, worked my butt off. Uh, I think that's kind of my MO is uh, my work ethic. And I think, I think that's visible to other guys. So I think that, that allowed me to uh, gain some respect um, and trust. And then, like I said, relationships, getting to know guys at a deeper level uh, past the surface. Um, and that allowed me to become in, come into a leadership role uh, pretty quickly. Most folks know what Coach Longo was able to do at North Carolina, even Ole Miss before that. But one of the things that stuck out to me about you is he said, we expect to be 100% accuracy from a completion standpoint in our quick game. So I'm going to ask it this way. 
is he as hard on you on routes on air as Coach Lashley might have been at Southern Methodist? Uh, uh, yeah, there's no doubt. I mean, they, they're both, they both uh, demand perfection. Um, I, I think that's what you got to do to be successful. Uh, Coach Lashley obviously, obviously is uh, uh, very successful in, uh, in the offense that he runs, and uh, so is Coach Longo. So, yeah, they're, they're definitely alike in that, in that fashion that uh, they expect perfection in the quick game and, and things that, that are uh, high completion throws. Uh, they need to be perfect, and uh, I, I would say both of them definitely demand that. I asked Braylon how you are integrating into Madison, so I'm going to ask you. What was your biggest, I'm from, I'm from Central Texas, I don't know what I'm doing out here moment in Madison, Wisconsin. Um, probably because that probably happened when um, I moved in. I uh, came up here uh, like the 18th or something like that, January. And on the 16th, I played golf in Texas when it was like 60 degrees. And then I got to Madison and there wasn't uh, one square inch that wasn't covered in snow when I got here. So, um, yeah, the, the, the weather change really was like, oh, wow, yeah, I'm not in Texas anymore. <laughs> well, there's that, but there's also going to be this Big Ten conference schedule that you're going to play. You're coming into a program that is not unlike Oklahoma in that it has sustained winning for over 20 years. I know you said you're excited, but do you feel any pressure to hold up the tradition that has become winning at Wisconsin? Um, there's a standard here that, uh, that, that involves a rich uh, winning tradition, um, and, and that's definitely our job to, uh, to keep that standard and raise the bar. And uh, I mean, I, I am excited. I don't, I don't think the pressure's uh, something that I'm worried about. Um, and I think these guys, this team, this culture, this staff is, is you know, uh, just so so thrilled to to put it on, put what we've been working on uh, on the field, and show everyone what we're about. I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you about another guy that began his career that signed to Oklahoma in Nick Evers. Yeah. What, if anything, has he done yeah. to impress you? Um, Nick is very talented. He uh, he has all the tools. Um, you know, he's a, he's a young cat. He uh, but but you know whenever he whenever he figures out um, you know the the process of of playing quarterback at a big level, I think I think the, the sky sky's the limit for Nick. Uh, he he's got everything that he needs to be successful, and I'll be excited to see what what he does. I think he's fortunate to have a guy like you to learn from because it strikes me and I'm sure many that your journey through the sport has been, well, really fascinating to watch, but also had some unique highs associated with it. Now that you're going into this season and you reflect on the journey that is taking you from Waco Midway to Madison, Wisconsin, what are you most grateful for? Um, I would say definitely my relationships. Uh, the relationships I've made, um, I mean, relationships and lessons learned for sure, but definitely the, the people I've met, um, you know, going back to Oklahoma, some of my best friends I talk to every single day are the people that I met at Oklahoma. Um, you know, we, we went through some things together, uh, COVID, all that stuff, and that just kind of brought us closer. So, and then going to SMU, um, same thing, meeting a lot of great people, a lot of my, my best friends that I'll, I'll have for the rest of my life. And I have no doubt I'll, I'll have the same, same experience here as at Wisconsin as far, as far as relationships go. Well, that's what I want for you. I also want you to have an outstanding season on the field. Wisconsin quarterback Tanner Mordecai, thank you so much for joining us here on the number one college football show. Thank you for having me. I'm pleased to be joined by Maryland head coach Mike Loxley. Coach, how you doing? What's going on, RJ? How are you? Chilling, money. I'm looking forward to this season for y'all because I'm looking at the schedule. There ain't but one winning program from last year in the first five games, and that's Towson. It looks like y'all could be 5-0 and by the time you got to go to the shoe. How you feeling this season? Are uh, you really going to do this to me, man? You're going you're gonna to start counting them up already? Come on, you can't do me like that, RJ. We, we got a big game to open up uh, the season against the unknown of what Towson has to offer my alma mater, uh, which I know the Tigers going to come in roaring. Um, to me, that's where a lot of the energy 
uh, and, and what we're preparing is all about. And then we'll deal with the rest of that schedule as, as it comes. But you and I both know, man, in college football and the landscape of the way it's gone, that every team showing up now has players that have come in or transferred in and have recruited. And, and we're all working for the same goal, which is to find a way to be successful. Well, that makes you too, Coach, uh, which means that we've seen a lot of moving pieces all over the country, all over the Big Ten. But you are fortunate in that you got a dude at quarterback that's been in the program for some time that knows exactly how you want to get down and do business. What kind of advantage do you think having Talia Tonga-Valoa lead your offense gives you? Well, the old adage of if you've got a quarterback, you've got a chance. We feel really strongly that we've got a quarterback at Maryland and you know, to have a guy of experience like Leah uh, that's been in the system now four years. I mean, it's almost unheard of in college football now to have a four-year starter at the, at the quarterback position. But to have a guy like Leah, his skill set, his talent, um, his leadership, definitely he's played uh, as big a role as anybody in where we've headed as a program. And, and it's going to be really important this year for him to take the next step. I'm going to do you one better, Coach. Uh, at UCLA, they had this cat, Dorian Thompson-Robinson, became the first five-year starter in the history of the sport. They won nine games last year. How close you feel? Like, I know I'm counting wins on you, but you've been getting better, and yeah. if you're getting a game better every year, feels like you're right there. Yeah, you know, if you've seen us the last couple of years, which I know you have, the, the trajectory of our program, it's definitely heading in the right direction. But I always caution our team and I'll caution you that every year we've got to start from ground zero. You know, we can't take the eight wins we had last year and say, oh, we're building on that because it doesn't work that way. We've got to start zero and zero. But what I've tried to get our team to understand is let's take some of the habits and behaviors that we showed a year ago that allowed us to win eight games. Let's do those, but let's do it a little bit better than we did a year ago. And uh, it's from top to bottom as coaches, staff, players, that if we each can get incrementally a little better this year at the habits and behaviors that we showed a year ago, then we'll be where we want to be at the end of the season. We talked a bit in the spring about some of the guys that you've added to your staff to help you get back to not just those eight wins, but pro progress on top of those eight wins. I got to ask, going into preseason camp, are you as excited as I am to see Josh Gaddis on the field coaching your offense and knowing you got Kevin Sumlin in the back looking everything over? Yeah, to have both those guys, to be able to add a guy like Josh, who I have a lot of respect for as a play caller, as a football coach. We worked together the 2017 or 2018 season at Alabama. The familiarity allows us to keep – what we do. And one of the things I've talked about is, you know, when we have the type of success like we've had the last couple of years, uh, the people in our program create value for themselves. And we've lost some really good staff members that added value and played a, a tremendous role in, in the way our program is headed. And so to be able to replace a Dan Enos with a guy like Josh Gaddis and Kevin Sumlin, uh, to me, is big because we were close in a, in a few games against the top teams in our league, you know, both Ohio State in Michigan and obviously close isn't good enough but when you bring in veteran coaches like Kevin Sumlin, Latrell Scott, Zach Spavadol, all these guys have been in some of these big games and 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 know how to to prepare for games like this and that's what I'm hopeful that we're able to get with the staff that we have for going into the 2023 season. It's difficult for anybody to replace the kind of production and talent you had in a Rock Jarrett and a Jacob Copeland but have you identified a couple of guys that you think can help you? You know, what's, what's ironic is a year ago, everybody was a little question in the running back room because we had lost some of the talent that we had, Jake Funk and, the, you know, the Anthony McFarlands and the Tayon Fleet Davises. And I cautioned people that we had a pretty good young group of guys. Well, I feel the same way about the receiver room that I felt last year about the running back room because we did lose some really talented players and Dante Demas and Rock Jarrett and, and Jacob Copeland. But we return a guy like Jay Sean Jones, who's a six year player. Seems like he's been around here forever. He's coming off of his first full season since I've been back home, um, you know, without injury. And again, I think he'll be a guy that hopefully we can get back to the form he showed as a, a true freshman when he came onto the scene and, and made big plays for the Terps. 
But then there's a bunch of young receivers, guys like Octavian Smith Jr. that you saw in the bowl game, uh, Shalik Punch Knotts, who played a lot, a huge role in the bowl game, uh, guys like Ty Felton, who now will take on bigger roles, and then the addition of guys like Caden Prather as well as uh, Tyrese Chambers from the transfer portal. We felt like we've really uh, reloaded that room and have given Leah some of the weapons that he's going to need for us to have success. Coach, one of the things I find remarkable about you is your ability to not just keep your cool, but keep your swag in a conference that I always knew was kind of buttoned down, three yards cloud, cloud of dust. You out here having a good time and putting on for the folks from Maryland area. How do you keep yourself in this game and doing it the way that only you could do it? You know what, I think it's being yourself. You know, too many times, one of the things I see with young coaches coming in is they want to mimic a coach that they work for or somebody have a lot of respect for. And I, I think it's good to take some of the philosophies that you like or that fit who you are as a coach. But for me, I'm really comfortable in my skin. And I think I've said this to you before, but since 2017, when I lost my son, Miko, uh, my give a crap gauge has been on E. And so, you know, I'm all about just, I'm gonna be authentically Michael Loxley. I'm gonna enjoy what I'm doing. I'm gonna live every day like there is no tomorrow because tomorrow's not a promise to any of us. Mm. Maryland head coach Mike Loxley, Coach Lox to the people. Thank you so much for joining us here on the number one college football show. Thanks for having me, RJ, man. Looking forward to seeing you, buddy. I'm pleased to be joined by Iowa defensive back Cooper DeGene. Cooper, how you doing? I'm great. How are you? I'm good. I'm very excited to talk with you because, frankly, dude, before you got to Iowa, something of a high school legend. And I kind of want to get into that because I'm looking at these statistics where you were passing for 3,500, you were scoring, what, 50 TDs, 60 TDs a year, 1,200 yards rushing, and then you played def defense. So, like, I got to ask, was anybody else looking at you at high school other than Iowa looking at these stats and what you were putting up? Uh, there, was, there, was, there was a couple other schools uh, in the FCS that were – that were recruiting me um, throughout high school. I had a couple offers from some F FCS schools, but other than that, it was it was it was just Iowa and, and the Power Five. Did you expect uh, to be treated as the kind of athlete that you are at Iowa? Because I'm again, I'm looking. You won the 100 meter state championship. In addition to being uh, just a highlight reel, there's a video of you going around dunking a basketball. So, I guess in all of that, why football? Um, I think I think football is 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 where my where my heart's at. You know, I came into high school, I thought I was going to be a basketball player, but um, I quickly figured out that that football would be would be the better better route for me. Um, you know, and I think I think playing all those sports um, in high school, uh, basketball, uh, baseball, track, um, those those other sports really helped me in in, in football um, in in a lot of different ways. Um, so sometimes I miss it, um, but I'm but I'm happy I, I stuck with football. Last year was a remarkable year for you. Three interceptions returned for touchdowns. That tying the school record. The next one is yours. You won MVP of the Music City Bowl playing defensive back. Was there something about last year that clicked for you in understanding your role in the defense? Yeah, you know, my, my freshman year was a real learning experience. I kind of got my feet wet on special teams, um, and then I was just learning from um, learning from the guys in our in our defensive back room. You know, the older guys like Riley Moss, uh, Kayvon Merriweather, um, those guys, um, which which really helped me this this past season. Um, just just understanding offenses um, and what they're trying to do, uh, helping me study film. Um, you know, just really, really feeling more comfortable out there um, on the field as a corner because I came in as a safety and I, I switched over to corner midseason my freshman year. Um, so I think I think those guys really helped out a lot. And then along with Coach Parker, um, you know, he's he's a great coach, great great uh, defensive mind. Um, you know, so he he's also helped out a lot. It's been clear to me that over the last two years, your defense has been the second best in the nation, and I don't think it's close. What do you think separates Coach Parker's defense from the rest? 
Yeah, I think it's just it's just the way we just the way we do things at Iowa, and the way we practice. Um, you know, we're we're hitting every single day in practice. Um, we're going hard. Everybody's running to the ball. Um, and the big thing we take pride in is everybody doing their job on the defensive side of the ball. And we think we think that we'll be all right um, as long as everybody's doing their job. Um, you know, coach, like I said, Coach Parker's a very very good coach. He's intense. Um, he expects the best out of everybody that's on the field. Um, and, and I think I really think that's that's what makes our our defense um, so special is he's he's a big part in that somehow that defense continues to turn out dudes and not just dudes but dudes from the state of Iowa in particular like I'm very excited to see what Aaron Graves is capable of being another guy that is from that state and a guy that I'm very excited about watching play football frankly for what he was able to do in high school what do you think it is about the state of Iowa that allows it to produce these sorts of players that end up being Hawkeyes and great FBS players. Yeah, I think I think people from Iowa just just have a an amazing work ethic. Um, day in and day out and they know they can't they can't cut any corners. Um, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of hidden talent in Iowa. I, I think um, guys guys that are real real athletic, and I think I think part of it is too too like we were talking earlier about playing multiple sports, and I think I think that's that's what a lot of kids in Iowa do, um, especially especially around mine and, and Aaron's um, area. We're we're both from from small towns, so you kind of have to kind of have to play um, multiple sports. Um, so I think I think that's a big part in it too. Would you describe playing for Kurt Ferentz as hard? Hard? Um, I'd say I'd say it's a lot of fun. Um, mm. You know, just just the way our just the way our program um, operates. You know, with the strength and conditioning, um, it's it's tough, but we know we know um, it's worth it. And what what we're working towards uh, when we're lifting those weights, running those sprints. Um, out on out on the field, um, so I think I think a lot of guys take pride in, in the process um, at Iowa. You know, we're we're a, we're a very detailed um, program. Um, you know, and you don't you don't see a lot of guys playing their first year just because of that of that development factor that that Iowa has. Um, you know, and I think I think that's what that's what makes Iowa really special. Not a lot of guys start out at safety and spin down to corner, but you did it last year at Iowa, and Riley Moss is going to do it in the NFL. What do you think it is that is preparing you guys to be able to play uh, on the field or the boundary? Yeah, I think um, just the way it goes back to Coach Parker. Um, you know, he he expects us to to be able to play every single position in the in the back end of the defense. Uh, while understanding the guys, the guys in front of in front of us and the, and their jobs, um, so I think I think that's that's something that helps helps guys out at at, at our at the University of Iowa, um, just being versatile and understanding um, what other what other positions are thinking when you're on the field, and I think I think that's that's what helps us our defense um, be so special year in and year out. Or in the case of you, sometimes even playing some outside linebacker. It does not feel like there isn't anything you can't do on a football <laughs> field. So to, to that point, athleticism is a big part of your game, and I believe that's the first thing that people point to. But do you think you're the most athletic person on that team? On, on our team, we got, we got a lot of athletic guys, um, um, I think. Um, a lot of guys that can play can play multiple positions, whether it's in the box, um, on the edge, um, wherever. So I think that's that, that again goes back to the strength and conditioning. You know, just just being able to to move our bodies um, wherever and however we we may need to to do it. Um, um, so yeah, I think I think we we like I said we take pride in in being able to play um, multiple spots and and under understanding different the different positions in our defense. How has Cade McNamara ingratiated or integrated himself into the Iowa culture? Yeah, he's came in and, and he's been a leader uh, since since the since the day he's got there almost um you know he's he's really vocal he's a real vocal guy um and he's he's helped um with our mentality going forward um this season you know he's he's had a lot of experience in in the big ten um 
you know, he's, he's played in the, in the college football playoff. Um, so he's, he's really helped us, um, I think, take that next step forward as, as, a, whole, as a whole team. Um, and, and on the field, he's, he's a great player. Um, but off the field, he's, he's, a, he's a really good human. Um, you know, he's, he's one, of my, one of my closest friends uh, since, he's, since he's got to Iowa. Um, he's, just, he's just a fun dude to, to be around. And I, I think he's, he'll, he'll make our team better. My last one for you. Uh, Tory Taylor, Heisman candidate. What do you think? I love it. I love it. I, th I mean, I think I think he's 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 really special. What he what he can do with his what he can do with his leg, um, and and I have fun running down and 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 stopping those balls that stop at the one or the two or wherever. Um, so I, I I love that, Tory Tory Taylor for Heisman. I have never seen a fan base so excited about a punter in my life. Hashtag for the brand, all of it. Cooper DeGene, <laughs> Iowa defensive back, thank you so much for joining us here on the number one college football show. Thanks for having me. I had a blast at the first day of Big Ten Media Day interviews. We got day two coming to you on Friday when you'll get to hear from Jim Harbaugh, Blake Corum, and what they are trying to do to make it a three-peat to win the Big Ten Championship. 